While analysing the real age of the Earth, we've seen compelling evidence from our planet, including tree ring counts, radiocarbon dating and var sediments, all of which took us up to a 100,000 year old Earth, at least. Soon we were in the hundreds of millions of years, using radiometric and magnetic dating of volcanic rocks, backed up by GPS measurements proving that the plates of the Earth move at the kind of speeds predicted by science. Now in this final episode of the series, The Real Age of the Earth, we will see how our planet and indeed our entire solar system is 4.5 billion years old, give or take a few million years. And for that, we'll be leaving the Earth, heading into space and back in time. The nebular hypothesis is the most widely scientifically accepted explanation for how our solar system, the Sun, the planets including Earth, comets and asteroids formed. It's a simple idea. The solar system formed from a spinning cloud of dust and gas which contracted under the force of gravity to form the sun and planets. Up till now, creationist groups like Answers in Genesis and the Institute for Creation Research have steadfastly refused to accept this model. And we can see what they are teaching their kids instead. What about the nebular hypothesis? There are many scientific and biblical problems with this idea. Bullet point one being, it is an inherently atheistic idea. It attempts to explain the origin of our solar system without supernatural causes. Now, for what it's worth, scientists call this science. Testable explanations and predictions about the universe do not include supernatural causes, which cannot be tested. But next stop, it contradicts the biblical order of events. God created the earth first, out of nothing, and then instantaneously created the heavenly bodies four days later. And this is essentially the same as the first point, that is, it is supernatural. And the last two points, not all planets in our solar system rotate in the same direction. Which is true, Venus and Uranus rotate clockwise, while the other planets rotate counterclockwise. And this is true. And it has also been explained by multiple models, including collisions with other large bodies, and the Sun's huge gravitational pull on Venus. And finally, the laws of physics dictate that gas will expand in space, not contract. Which is patently absurd, as of course gravity exists. So, which is it? Did our solar system and all other solar systems in the universe form from a spinning cloud of dust and gas? Or did God create the entire universe as an afterthought four days after creating the Earth out of nothing? We're about to find out. On the 8th of February 1969, the Allende meteorite fell to Earth over the Mexican state of Chihuahua. It was originally about the size of a car, but it broke up in the atmosphere, spreading smaller meteorites over a wide area. Over the next few years, over two tons of material were recovered, and Allende was soon realised to be quite a rare type of meteorite called a carbonaceous chondrite, which are thought to be some of the oldest, most primitive solid bodies in the solar system it would soon become the best studied meteorite in history. It was six years after it fell to Earth when something very curious was noticed in one of the pieces. But before I get to that, we will need a brief recap of radiometric dating. In the second episode of this series, I discussed carbon-14 dating and included a demonstration of how nitrogen-14, the most stable isotope of nitrogen, was turned into carbon-14 in the Earth's atmosphere. Carbon-14 is unstable, however, and is slowly decaying, or turning back to that nitrogen-14. The time that this decay takes is called the half-life of an isotope, and carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. We can test carbon-14 dating on organic material. So say we had a 5,730-year-old tree and measured the amount of carbon-14 in the innermost ring. It should have almost exactly half the amount compared to the outermost ring which is only one year old. And if we had a tree which was 11,460 years old, the innermost ring would only have one quarter of the carbon-14 content of the outermost ring, and so on. Eventually, after about 50,000 years or so, the amount of carbon-14 in a sample is indistinguishable from background radiation. So carbon-14 dating is only a good measurement to around 50,000 years in the past. We know the ratios of how each isotope exists in nature. For example, the vast majority of carbon on Earth is carbon-12, 
at 98.9% of all carbon atoms. Carbon-13 makes up most of the remaining 1.1%, while carbon-14 only exists in one part per trillion carbon atoms. That's one carbon-14 atom for every trillion carbon-12, or carbon-13 atoms. And in fact, every element, whether that's hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, or a metal like gold, has multiple isotopes in different ratios. One such isotope, magnesium-26, when found in a piece of the Allende meteorite, had an unexpected ratio. Magnesium has three stable isotopes, magnesium-24, 25, and 26. Of these, magnesium-24 is by far the most common, at 79%. Magnesium-25 is 10%, and magnesium-24 is 11%. And when the sample of the Allende meteorite was tested in 1976, it was discovered to contain the expected amounts of magnesium-24 and 25, but had 1.3% more magnesium-26. Now, you might think, only 1.3% more, that's not much. But when you consider that everywhere else you check the ratio of magnesium isotopes, it will be almost exactly as expected. Then this 1.3% extra magnesium-26 is a clear anomaly, for which there has to be a reason. That reason is aluminium-26. Aluminium has 22 isotopes, but only aluminium-27 is stable, and as we can see, has a ratio of 1, which is to say, it is all that effectively exists. Aluminium-26 is the only other naturally occurring isotope, but it is now extinct in our solar system. When you hear the word extinct, you probably think about something that used to exist or live long ago, but no longer does. And that is exactly what aluminium-26 is. It's an isotope which was created before the sun and planets formed. We believe due to a supernova explosion of a nearby star. The reason aluminium-26 no longer exists in the solar system is due to its half-life of only 730,000 years. And when it decays? it decays to magnesium-26. The presence of this extra, magnesium-26, therefore must mean that the meteorite formed in the solar nebula before the aluminium-26 had time to decay, which means the Allende meteorite is among the oldest objects in the solar system. Remember, aluminium-26 has a half-life of 730,000 years. And while that is over 120 times longer than the creationist theory of a 6,000 year old Earth, 730,000 years is still very small in cosmological timescales. After 730,000 years, only half of all the aluminium-26 in our solar system remained. And after only 7.3 million years, all aluminium-26 in the solar system would have turned to magnesium-26. That's why there is none left today and it's why the only way we could tell it ever existed is due to the presence of this extra magnesium-26 in primitive meteorites like Allende. And so these primitive meteorites give us the best indication of the age of our solar system, their history basically frozen into the rock since their creation. No matter what radiometric dating method that we use, and there are many, over multiple testing labs, the ages always come in above 4 billion years and clump around the 4.5 to 4.6 billion year mark. With the currently accepted best estimate of the age of the Allende meteorite being 4.56718 plus or minus 0 0.0002 billion years old, which was based on lead to lead dating, the blue one here. And what's important to realise is that different parts of the same meteorite show similar ages. This extremely long list of testing on fragments of the same Allende meteorite by different scientists at different labs using different dating methods, we can see a very clear clump around 4.5 to 4.6 billion years. And this research paper was written for Answers in Genesis by our old friend Dr. Andrew A. Snelling back in 2014. The actual research done is of extremely high quality full of facts, photographs and figures, but the second half of the paper is full of what ifs and maybe God did X or Y. An example of that being, but what if God made all the isotopes at the beginning in the primordial material? Which is just pure speculation, and by this point, there is no actual science being done here. 
It's simply an attempt to justify the creation story in the Bible from the young earther perspective, regardless of the overwhelming evidence against a young earth. But Snelling had to conclude with, there is no doubt that after decades of numerous careful radioisotope dating investigations of the Allende CV3 carbonaceous chondrite meteorite, that it's lead to lead isochron age of 4.56718 plus or minus 0.0002 billion years has been well established. And the lead to lead isochron dating method stands supreme as the ultimate, most precise tool for determining the age of the Allende CV3 carbonaceous chondrite meteorite. 4.567 billion years, not 6,000. Andrew Snelling is one of the foremost young earth creationists and an actual geologist of very high calibre when doing actual scientific research. And I was reminded in the first episode of this series when another young earth creationist, John Woodmorap, could also find no fault when counting the White Mountain tree ring record in California. And so to end this series on the real age of the Earth, with what we currently believe the real age to be, we likely never know because the Earth is and always has been a volcanic world and plate tectonics means that the crust is being renewed. To understand what that means, we can take a quick look at moon rocks. Yes, we have been to the moon and we have brought back rocks. The oldest rocks were aged at 4.44 billion years, so about 100 million years younger than Allende and other primitive meteorites. We also have younger rocks from the moon, dated at around 3.16 billion years ago. These coming from the dark spots, which were formed by volcanic eruptions, which is why they're younger. And back on Earth, we currently have rocks and zircon minerals. Zircons are used due to their high resistance to chemical change. And these are dated to around 4.3 billion years. That's as old as we can currently find on Earth, and they are very, very rare. But looking at this chart, we can see how precise dating of these are. Science believes that the real age of the Earth that we know of today is 4.54 billion years old. We believe that the solar system formed soon after a massive star went supernova in our vicinity, creating exotic elements like aluminium-26 with short half-lives, which we could only measure by looking at the ratio of magnesium-26 it left over in the ancient Allende meteorite. That was until 1984 at least, when a new satellite called the High Energy Astronomy Observatory 3 detected aluminium-26 decay throughout the Milky Way, clumped near the core and less on the outskirts of the galaxy as of course newer, more massive stars are created and go supernova far more regularly at the core. This map clearly shows us aluminium-26 in our galaxy, an element which has been extinct for billions of years in our solar system. After the nearby supernova, gas and dust in the interstellar medium began to collapse together under the force of gravity in the process we call the nebular hypothesis. Most of the collapsing mass collected in the centre, forming the sun, while the rest flattened into a protoplanetary disk, out of which the planets, moons, asteroids and other smaller solar system bodies formed. While Answers in Genesis dismisses the nebular hypothesis as being inherently atheist and attempting to explain the origin of our solar system without supernatural cause, there is no evidence of God creating the Earth, Sun, planets or stars. There is today, however, well over 100 pieces of evidence showing protoplanetary disks around young stars, thanks mostly to the ALMA telescope array built nine years ago. The young star in the centre, surrounded by huge molecular gas clouds, and we can see clear rings, which give us clear evidence of planet formation around these young stars. These are all different young stars at various stages of solar evolution, but direct images of planets had evaded us. Until finally, last July, the European Southern Observatory imaged two large planets, about the size of Jupiter, around a young nearby star. And this October, the James Webb Space Telescope will finally launch its explicit purpose to find exoplanets information around young stars. It will be very special indeed and leave no hiding place for the affront to science and humanity that is the theory of young Earth creationism. I'll catch you later, guys.